So in terms of the MPSs, as we all appreciate in this room, there are lysosomal storage disorders. There's actually 11 known enzyme deficiencies in the MPS, which comprise seven different clinical groups, which I'll talk about. Each one is quite rare, but as an aggregate, at least in North America and Central Europe, uh, we're talking about one in 25,000. So it's not that uncommon, even though it's still quite rare. The hallmark of these disorders are their tissue storage of glycosamiaglycans. This results in progressive disorders with multi-system involvement, virtually every organ system is involved in the MPS. As any inborn errors, we all appreciate it as geneticists, there's a wide spectrum of severity from very severe to very mild. Uh, and this certainly applies to the MPS. Of the MPS 1, 2, and 7 all have multisystemic disease and CNS involvement, but they never have only CNS disease. They can have just physical disease, but not central nervous, but they all have physical disease, uh, and some have, in the severe forms, have both. Where contrast, MPS 1, 2, 7, and 3 all can have neurological involvement, and that's because heparin sulfate is, is made in the brain, and that's where it gets stored and causes the damage. And then contrast to that to MPS6, they only accumulate dermatin sulfate, therefore they don't have any neurological involvement, and dermatin sulfate we now know to be primarily a somatic disease, somatic finding, and therefore <clears throat> they have that spectrum. In contrast, MPS3, or San Filippo syndromes, is a primary neurologic disorder with very mild physical forms, and these patients are typically missed for a long time um, because they don't have the striking physical features. In contrast to that, MPS4 is really a skeletal dysplasia <clears throat> with no primary neurological involvement. And the same way with MPS6, it's primarily a, a physical disease without central nervous system involvement, but the physical disease is very similar to what happens in MPS1, 2, and 7. What's the disease pathophysiology? How does the storage disease result in what we see in terms of the clinical features? We clearly know that deficiency of a lysosomal enzyme results in the glycosamiaglycan accumulation. But as I alluded to already, the storage is tissue-specific for each different type of enzyme. I presume the liver and spleen enlargement and the coarse facial features are really due to the just the direct tissue storage of glycosamiaglycan. It's just that physical storage causes the abnormal appearance we deal with in the MPS population. The skeletal disease is most likely due to disruption of the growth plates uh, with, with this material occurring there, even though that's not totally proven. Valvular heart disease appears primarily due to storage of the glycosamiaglycan in that heart valve and then sec secondary fibrosis. And that's why once you have uh, disease accumulate or disease burden occur in the MPS patients, a lot of time it's irreversible because here's the example, the primary storage is a gag, but then the secondary fibrosis always going to make that valve abnormal. You can never recover it. So prevention is really the name of the game for the MPS disorders. Airway disease is believed secondary to storage of the glycosamiaglycans in soft tissue, so they have actually decreased airway size, and they also have abnormal tracheal rings. So tracheal malacia is a very significant issue that is a very floppy trachea that can cause significant airway issues. Unfortunately, the mechanism of the central nervous system disease is really unclear, and it's probably due to multiple, multiple secondary events, such as inflammation, apoptosis, and other things we're not even aware of yet, probably. But I think there's a lot to be learned in the basic pathophysiology of the brain disease. I'm going to just talk about the different disorders from 1 to, uh, to 7. MPS1 is deficiency of the enzyme iuronidase. Onset of symptoms can be as early as six months, if sometimes not earlier, in the severe form, that is Hurler syndrome. The Hurler syndrome patients historically died between 3 and 10 years of age, and not uncommonly they died of coronary artery disease, they actually had a myocardial infarct with illnesses. In North America and Europe, it's estimated incidence of 1 in 100,000, but we really don't know it true incidence. And again, it's an autosomal recessive disorder, I'm just showing that now we think about severe and attenuated, and there's really a spectrum because I can't draw the line where Hurler ends and Hurler-Shea starts or Hurler-Shea 
starts and Shea begins. And so it's really a spectrum from severe to attenuated. And there's patients throughout this spectrum of severity. And that's one of the challenges. Everybody can be a little different. On MPS2, Hunter syndrome, the deficiency enzyme iuronate 2 sulfatase. Onset of symptoms in the severe form are between one and three years of age. So the, the patients with a severe form of MPS1 occur earlier than the patients with a severe form of MPS2. These patients will die in their teenage years in the severe form of overwhelming neurological and airway issues. Again, it's a rare disorder. Who knows what the incidence is? But it's probably somewhere around one in 100,000. Uh, it's the only X-linked disorder among all the MPSs. And I'm not aware of carrier females having any significant uh, evidence of disease, even though there's a recent, uh, recent uh, Spanish paper talking about some issues. We do see a small number of females with MPS2 uh, have been reported. For example, X autosomal translocations is one of the explanations for that. Uh, and there's about <clears throat> maybe 20 or 30 of these patients worldwide, but quite rare. As we've seen with MPS1, there's clearly a spectrum of severity. What about prediction of clinical severity in MPS2? You cannot make the prediction of clinical severity based on the, the residual enzyme activity. If you have none, you can still have attenuated because the assay was never designed to tease out this one or less than 1% of activity. So it's, it's a diagnostic assay, and it's made to, uh, <clears throat> to give the diagnosis yes or no, not to predict severity. In general, the earlier the onset of physical disease, the more likely a severe phenotype occurs. It's not an absolute. DNA mutation analysis allows predictions of the severe phenotype in a patient with a large deletion or rearrangement. And so if you have those patients, you can make that prediction. Unfortunately, the determination of clinical severity for most patients cannot be made at the time of diagnosis. If you're diagnosed at two or three, it's difficult to know whether you have attenuated patient or severe patient. Given that in the North America and Europe, it's two-thirds severe, one-third attenuated, you're more likely to have severe patient, but you can't be sure even though you pick somebody up at two or three, uh, depending on their severity. But with time, I say to families, if you get to the age of five or six and are intellectually intact in appropriate grade for age in school, you never go on to have severe disease. The patients have a 50% chance of a lifetime risk of having a seizure. Communicating hydrocephalus is a significant issue in this population. They have severe sensory neural hearing loss. And clearly, for attenuated patients, the issue, they have decreased night and peripheral vision. So if you're driving a car, that's very important to be aware. So your, your attenuated MPS2 patients need to have their vision checked and their peripheral vision, because if you can't see well at night or see peripherally, you're much greater risk for uh, getting an accident driving. The hallmark of the San Filippos are profound cognitive impairment, severe hyperactivity when they're four or five years of age, relatively mild somatic features, and unfortunately death in the teenage years of overwhelming neurologic disease. Over half the families I have diagnosed in the US with San Filippo syndrome have been told by different people, you need professional help to manage your child's behavior. This behavior that we see in the San Filippo, the hyperactivity, is really a direct result of the neurologic deterioration, and it's not because the parents don't discipline. Most patients have severe neurological impairment by six to 10. A lot of them stop walking at a time. Some of them never get, in, never get out of diapers. Some of them never have much in the way of language. I recently, in contrast, though, met a 45-year-old a lady with developmental impairment who had San Filippo syndrome diagnosed at age 30 by somebody who was very astute. Uh, and so there is milder form, Morchio syndrome, or MPS4. It's really a skeletal disorder. It's due to two different enzymes, A by far the most common. It's estimated, at least in North America, that one in a quarter million individuals have uh, Morchio syndrome. Like all the other disorders, there's a wide spectrum of clinical severity. Uh, and, and they have primary no neurological involvement, even though they, they can have significant neurological sequelae from spinal cord issues, secondary to instability in the neck. One of the hallmarks of the Morchio, they have joint laxity, where all the other MPSs have joint contractures uh, with MPS 1, 2, uh, 6, and 7. 
where the morcules are really very floppy, uh, and you can really recognize them as that, as a different, really different spectrum. They're really more of a skeletal dysplasia. MPS6, Maritol MA, <coughs> enzyme deficient aerosulfatase B, again, has a wide range of multisystemic involvement, but have normal cognition. The severe forms can die in their first and second decade of life due to severe cardiac and airway disease. That is the same valvular disease we see in the MPS1 and 2 uh, patients. And they can have the same airway issues with obstructive airway disease and severe brachial molation. Those combinations can be life-threatening. MPS7 is Sly syndrome. I've, I've actually only seen one patient myself in my clinic with Sly syndrome. Its clinical picture looks like MPS1, has the same spectrum of severity in terms of both multi-system involvement, neurological involvement. Hydrox fatalis is probably the most common presentation of this disorder and probably gets missed by people who are not, who don't think a, a non-immune hydrops can be a storage disease. They have a very varied presentation in terms of <clears throat> their features. One of the features is ingual hernias concur very commonly and these kids get operated on and get sent on their way and the surgeon never felt the liver, never looked at the joints. They did what they were supposed to do and they went on and so they get missed. Hepatosplenomegaly is clearly another common presentation, uh, but some of the kids can be difficult to examine. They're hyperactive, so that can, can be missed some. Clearly, bone x-rays, skeletal dysplasias are another way to say. So sometimes I'll use a screening test in terms of doing some x-rays of their hands and spine to help me recognize what they may have. Curly joint restriction and stiffness are very common and actually get overlooked. New onset murmurs curly can be a significant focus for a diagnosis. Curly in the older patients with MPS 1 and 2, that is 4, 5, and 6, sometimes through the recurrent pneumonia, bring them in, they get a pneumonia, and finally somebody recognizes on their chest x-ray, those bones look very different and that then brings them to a diagnosis. Our MPS2 patients have this unique nodule over their back, or over their back shoulders that sometimes you can make the diagnosis, but only about 20% have that. Clearly, sensory neuro hearing loss is a very common feature, and a lot of the patients have it a diagnosis, along with cognitive impairment or developmental delay. Any one of those features that I list there does not make the diagnosis. But when you start having two or three of those features with different organ system involvement, then you should really suggest this is possibly a storage disorder. This is a multisystemic disease. And you should really think of an MPS disorder when you have any of those combination of two or three of those features. We clearly have cardiovascular disease that can occur, primary valve disease, and occasionally a severe cardiomyopathies. We have respiratory problems that occur in terms of obstructive airway disease, uh, restrictive lung disease, and significant reactive airway disease is not uncommon. Hearing impairment in terms of sensory neuro hearing loss is almost uniform uh, in, in this population. They have skeletal involvements in terms of joint stiffness. They can have pain and curly short stature for a lot of individuals is very common. In MPS1 and some of the other ones, six, we see vision issues in terms of corneal clouding. Glaucoma can occur in MPS1. I should make a note that we do not see any obvious corneal clouding in MPS2. So if you see a, a child with a corneal clouding, it's much more likely MPS1 or MPS6. We see gastrointestinal involvement in terms of just hepatosplenomegaly, and we see an ingual and umbilical hernias. Uh, we see episodic di diarrhea, but we don't see liver failure. Chronic infections occur in terms of re recurrent pneumonias and otitis medias, and they have significant dental issues in terms of abnormal shaped and spaced teeth, and they have premature cavity issues, uh, and they're at risk for dental abscesses, which is very rare in the pediatric population. The bone disease is sort of a hallmark that can be recognized as so-called dysostosis multiplex. They have enlarged, thickened skulls with macrocephaly, that is, big heads. They have odontoid hypoplasia with cervical instability, which can be a really significant problem uh, in MPS1, 2, and MP1, MPS1, 2, 4, and 6. They have abnormal vertebral bodies and anterior beaking, which sometimes will recognize it. Uh, they have certainly kyphosis and scoliosis, so they have curvature of the spine in a variety of ways. They have abnormal fingers in terms of these bullet-shaped 
phalanges. They have called oar-shaped ribs where they're narrow at the middle and broad at the ends. They have very abnormal hips, and certainly the morchios are, un are unique. They really have severe genuvalgum that makes it walking very difficult for a lot of those individuals. These very abnormal ribs, broad ribs with sort of narrower connections, and most pediatric radiologists can recognize this. You can't make the diagnosis of what type of MPS based on the, on the bone disease, but you can clearly say that's most likely an MPS.